Good morning. And I, I'd just like to start by um, humbly thanking the SMAC organising committee and Chris Nixon for indulging me and letting me come and speak with you again. When you are an Australian social worker and you speak behind three exceptional speakers followed by a whole day yesterday of exceptional speakers, there's only one thing you can really do, and that's to talk about love with lots of sexual innuendo. <laughs> there is, um, someone said to me, it's so nice that they ask you to these medical conferences to talk about all the soft things like love. I'm not sure what country you come from, but in Australia, love is usually long and hard. And uh, <laughs> certainly some of the most difficult circumstances in my life and, and in, with the families that I work with, the teams that I have, involve love. And it often interests me that people say, well, we leave all the mushy stuff to you. We leave like the touchy-feely stuff to you. That's your job as a social worker, because what do I know about that? I'm gonna pose a question to you. Put up your hand if you have ever personally been on an ECMO circuit. Put up your hand if you personally have ever been resuscitated. Put up your hand if you've ever had hemofiltration. There's a couple of people. Put up your hand if you have ever been in love. You're pretty stupid, aren't you? You know a lot more about love than you give yourself credit for. So I only have one message today. Vic Brazel teaches everyone, everyone must, and Simon Carly, you must have three messages. I just have one. Love can revolutionize the way we do critical care. Who here has ever been in love for the first time with someone, and even if it doesn't last, you know those first initial days and weeks and sometimes months, and hopefully for some of you years, where you are so sparkly in love. You know where you've just got it all going on. Nothing can touch you when you feel really loved and you are in love. You don't care as much about anything else that's happening with the world. You get a red light, it's pouring rain. It doesn't matter because you are loved up and ready to go. I'm gonna encourage you after this talk to become love ambassadors for your critical care. Share that love like you've got nothing holding you back. Big open heart every single day and see what that feels like. And what I'm gonna to prove to you today is there is science to demonstrate that it will make us have exceptioned exceptional patient safety and quality. And that's what we're on about. We're talking about human beings that we are trying to save, make better, you know, endure whatever time they have left to the best of our ability. And if we love with great passion and enthusiasm, I'm gonna to demonstrate to you that that can happen. So when I was thinking about this talk, I thought, you know what? One of the most successful relationships I've ever had in my life is my relationship with work. So anyone who tries to talk to you about work-life balance and you feel all stressed about it, it's because it's a load of crap. There is no such thing as work-life balance. We spend the majority of our lives at friggin' work. We're nowhere else. Particularly for most of you who do shift work, 12 hours, you've got time to just go home, have something to eat. Depends how long it takes you to do certain activities, you might do that and then go to sleep, and then you get up and you go to work again. So if you're aiming for work-life balance, you're gonna be bitterly disappointed. But if work is something that you love and feel passionate about, then life is going to be okay. And when I thought about it, I thought about maybe the first time you think you want to fall in love or the first time you're thinking about being intimate with someone. Maybe you're a, a virginal trauma person, so you've, you're in critical care, but you've never been to your first recess, you've never had your first trauma attend, you've never gone to your first met call or, you know, whatever you call it, codes in your, in your hospital. It's the same thing when you think you're ready to put yourself out there and have a chippity chop at someone. And initially, it's all you can think about. You just want that opportunity. You feel fired up and ready to go. You feel like you've got the skills. You just need to, you know, have the opportunity to demonstrate them to the world. I remember when this happened to me specifically, personally. 
where I thought maybe I was ready to go the next level. And I was watching Back to the Future 2. And the boy I was with put his hand on my boob, on the outside of my shirt, and didn't even move it. <laughs> and I was like, not ready to go the next level. And it can feel like that with critical care where you're like, you know, I think I'm ready, I'm ready to go into the trauma, and then the first time it happens, you're like, I'm too immature, I'm too little, I forget what to do. But then all of a sudden you have an opportunity and you get in there, and whatever it is that you get to do, but usually I saw someone tweeted the other day, I got to do my first chest compressions. <laughs> and I thought, it is like that first time you've really had a go at things. Just so proud. So you get in there and you're having a go at critical care, you're doing your chest compressions, everything works out, and don't you come out in a red velvet smoking jacket with a cigar. It's like, <laughs> my God, did you see me in there? I was incredible. And all day it's like, you know what I did in there today? You've seen it happen. And then you want to do it again, don't you? Hopefully, if you had a good experience. You want to do it again and again. You want to improve things, stir it up a little bit, see what's going to happen. Pretty soon you think, I bet you if anyone wants to do it, they want to do it with me. <laughs> but then inevitably what will happen is one day, quite out of the blue, you're going to go in there and for some reason you just can't get your rhythm. It's just not, it's not happening. The usual moves, it's not going well. And things can go wrong and all of a sudden you start to question everything that you knew before. That's what real relationships are like. They evolve over time. For anyone who's been married or in a long-term relationship, it's not always hot and feisty. There are times when it's difficult, when you hang in there and it's got nothing to do with the hot spice. It's just simply because you believe in what you do. And that's exactly the same relationship we have to have with critical care. It starts off all hot and spicy, and every now and then you get to have those glimmers of going back there. But on the whole, it's not about resus. It is about looking after the agitated patient. It is about fear. It is about looking after the elderly. It is about hanging in there. And often what sustains us in really difficult times of the relationships, it's love. Now, this is a very inappropriate picture. I do apologize for that. I, I Googled human tower because I wanted to demonstrate, and this came up. I am not suggesting this is what you should do after ward round. However, if it works for you, by all means, but I really want to talk to you about love and leadership in critical care. Does love have a place in leadership? Let's look at some of the most powerful leaders that we've seen in our lifetime and the way they did it. People that we talk about, not about with fear or with concern or where you do what you're told because you're scared what the outcome will be, but just because you admire who they are. None of these people do it by force, by anger, by not using manners. They've done it through love and compassion. The greatest leaders in critical care, that doesn't mean they're soft, doesn't mean they can't make difficult decisions, are people who do it using love and compassion. I actually looked to uh, John Gottman, who is the leading expert on family therapy and couple counselling, and I tweaked some of what he said to talk about with you about love and leadership in critical care. Because to me, the greatest leaders in critical care create a climate of trust and intimacy that makes individuals and the team feel emotionally and physically safe. And not only does that bring out the best in people, but that safety allows us to have robust conversations and conflict. And that's an art that we're losing in critical care, and it's to the detriment of our patients. There are times when we need to disagree with each other, when we need to ethically thrash out what is going on with patients so that we know that we're doing the right thing. And it isn't in a climate of love and intimacy and trust that we have that with teams, that those sorts of conversations can occur. So sometimes I think people think that leadership is about just being real tough ass, being a dictator, and it's not at all. I've had the greatest privilege to work with some sensational directors in our pediatric intensive care unit. 
Bruce Lister, who some of you may know, is one of the funniest, most inappropriate men around. Um, but he has this warm nature and he had a way, if something was going on in the unit that was big, he would always buy pizza or put out some lollies or he'd just come and he, he would often just, um, he rubs people on the shoulder and he says, good job and tells you a funny story. And every day people wanted to make him happy by doing the right thing, working hard. So if he asked anything of you, you did it. Mark Hayden was another exceptional leader for us. He would come in and every day he would set the bar so high up here for everything, hand washing, quality, it didn't matter, it was up here. And every day we all strive to get there even though he could be an asshole at times because he was an exceptional leader and we didn't want to let him down. Good leaders muck in. Good leaders do the dirty work. Good leaders make their nurses a cup of tea. Good leaders do all of the things to demonstrate, I know what your job is. They have a good sense of humour. They apologise really quickly when they've made a mistake. They're genuine. They create an environment of trust. They love their staff. If someone comes after their staff, talking about Ross, a good leader stands in front and takes every bullet even if a mistake was made. You can have those private conversations behind closed doors, but a good leader looks after their team at all times. In my PhD study, when we asked people what was the most stressful thing that happens in an intensive care, it had nothing to do with death. Actually, a child's death is often what for most people is the most important and meaning-making part of the job. What made people most distressed all the time is not feeling appreciated, feeling bullied, feeling that they're being asked to do things beyond their skill set, feeling unsupported, feeling that they've got no opportunity to have education. Our critical care teams are our family and we've got to bring good love. Who do you want to be as a team member every day? When you finish that shift, what do you want people to say about you? If you are a team leader, if you're a consultant that leads the floor, you set the tone, you set the climate every day. Do you know what we do with leaders? Because I do it myself. As soon as I come into the unit, I'm like, who's on? Because then I know what sort of day I'm going to have. Because you're setting the climate. What do you want us to say about you? It takes nothing to say thank you. It doesn't take two seconds to say, good job, well done. That was shit and you still bought it. Thank you. It takes nothing and yet it elates people. Do you know that when people feel loved and supported and appreciated, your brain capacity grows? People's ability to make difficult decisions is greater when they feel supported. When people feel intimidated, stressed, it's much harder for them to be able to make good decisions. It's much harder for them to be able to be their best person, to, to access all higher functions of their brain. At work, everyone should always have at least one work husband or one work wife. Do you have that expression? Do you know who your work husband and wife is? I have several because I'm more woman than one doctor can take, it's what they've told me. <laughs> that was actually a quote from, from a ward round. One of our doctors said, I know that you're more than one, or any woman that I can take. And I was like, that is true. But your critical care team means everything. The other thing we've discovered in our PH, my PhD's work is people are saying, the people I confide in, the people that I go to is the team because my family and friends cannot possibly understand what I do. I don't want to expose them to it. I don't want them to actually know how dark and how awful things can get at work. And so that means our team has to be on the ball all the time because they're the people we need for support. They're our community. Who do you want to be? Love builds innovation and creativity. It's not the brain. If you have a fantastic idea, it is usually driven from your heart, not your brain. This whole conference came from three Australian guys who had a passion. Me too. Oh. That so doesn't count, Chris Nixon. 
And please don't heckle spe speakers on the stage. Um, that means that this great conference came from two amazing Australians and a retarded New Zealander. But it came from passion. It didn't start with intellect. It became even foam ed over a beer. You can't tell me they were operating at their highest function. It came from here. People who believe that what we have to do is important, that we have to bring the very best that we have every single day. Google puts gym machines and coffee machines and things all around their office. Why? Because they know when people feel passionate, they're going to be energized. Their ideas are going to be greater. We are working in an environment that's going to get tougher and tougher and tougher, where our executive will understand less and less and less what they're asking us to do. We're going to have to bring it ourselves. And that's going to take love. The greater love ambassador you can be, the bigger your brain, the bigger everything will be for you. <laughs> what? <laughs> All right, love and patience. We see people in the most vulnerable, horrific, frightening moments of their lives. Bring a little bit of love. You will be surprised if you bring love and respect and compassion to every single family that you see, how much faster you'll get out of there. That could have been a sexual innuendo quite unintentionally. <laughs> if you start every conversation with a, you must have been having a hard day. It's two o'clock in the morning. I'm really sorry that you've been waiting for so long to be seen. Even if it's a paper cut or an ear infection, if you start the conversation off with a little bit of loving, lots of compassion, a little bit of rapport, it means that if it takes you five stabs to get the cannula in, they'll forgive you. If it takes you a while to come back, they'll forgive you. You know why? Because they believe that you care about them. And they'll be much more lenient. Once you start off being a dick, it's very hard to come back from that. One of the things that really saddens me at the moment in health is we are constantly teaching people how to have good boundaries, great parameters, not to overstep the mark. And yet we are doing nothing about teaching about compassion and love. You know, if we look back on the history of medicine, that's all we had to bring. I've said this before at a SMAC conference, I think, but for those of you who are old enough who ever watched the, the um, TV series Little House on the Prairie, there was Doc, whatever his name is, and someone would get word that someone had been kicked in the head by a horse. And it would always show him, he'd get on his horse and he'd ride as hard as he could and he'd pull up in the dust and he'd jump out and he'd get up and he'd stand there because he had no tools. <laughs> he had no medicine. He just stood there. And he looked after people with his hands by caring about them and with his voice and with his face. And he stayed until people died. That was how our history... Now, I don't, I don't think we should go back to that. I think we've got a number of really good resources that we can utilise. But I do think it's exceptionally important that we remember why it, what brought us here. And do you know, the more you care about your patients the less likely you are to be burnt out. That's a fact. I've just looked at 468 surveys in great detail, and people can have very, very high rates of burnout, and it does not affect their levels of meaning-making and compassion. They can happen even simultaneously, but it is a protective factor, because not every day will you be able to cure people not every day will you have the opportunity to know that everything you did went perfectly right. But every single day, you will have the opportunity to make a strong connection, to make a difference, even if it's something very small to another human being. There are people who search their whole lives to have one day that feels meaningful. And we have that opportunity every single working day. That's friggin' awesome. I have no idea how to pronounce this word. And when I was trying this morning, going ikigai, 
It sounded like, for those of you who've ever watched The Goodies, they had this black custard thing called Icky Thump. I don't think it's that, but Icky Gaki, Icky Guy, anyone who can speak this language, I just love what this represents. If you can bring something that you're good at and match it with something that you love and match it with something that the world needs and match it with something that you, have been, that you can get paid for, you are living in an absolute environment of blessing. And look, I'm not saying that our work is easy. It isn't. Last year was the hardest, crappiest year of my life at work, and I could have walked away a million times. But I didn't, because I believe in our patients. I believe in our team. And I don't think I could be happy anywhere else. I also am not sure I have any other skills. <laughs> I've got a friend who um, is an exceptional musician, but there's a lot of exceptional musicians who never make it to the big time. And in the 90s, I believe he had a num one hit song in Australia that unfortunately I don't know what that is. And he really wanted to make a living out of music, and it just wasn't a possibility. He just couldn't crack the market. And so even though he now works in pastoral care or in chaplaincy in hospitals and does a sensational job of that, he still has his own little recording studio underneath his house. And uh, he often you know, plays instruments way into the night. It's his way of kind of debriefing and, and winding down at the end of the day. He does a lot of palliative care work. And one day I saw him and his hands were really calloused and they were cut and bleeding and they just looked terrible. And I said, were you gardening all weekend? And he said, no, I, I, just, I was trying to get something right on the guitar and I played it and I played it and I played it until I've destroyed my hands. And I said, did you stop playing? And he said, no, I didn't. And I had this absolute aha moment. Sometimes I walk into our unit and I'm just tired because of life. And sometimes I walk into our unit and I feel really exhilarated. I'm always really happy to see my colleagues. I'm always really interested to hear what cases are in. I'm always really heartbroken for the families that are in our unit. Some days really suck at our job. Some days we're gonna have you know, issues with leadership. Some days we're gonna have agitated patients. Some days we're going to be frightened. Some days we're going to be a little bit broken. I'm always really mindful, though, that I have never asked anything more of myself than I ask of every family every single day. I'm paid to be there. Not a single child who's in those beds and not a single family had a choice about it. But what I realised that day in talking to my friend is that there are times that this job can almost feel like it could destroy you or break your heart or cut you or leave you broken. But there are times that it will leave you feeling so magically alive that what you do is so exceptionally important. And that's why I will never walk away from this job because I enjoy the music too much. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. And uh, Tim, thoughts, comments, questions? Look, we can just feel the love in the room, Liz. Fantastic. If, uh, the lots of tweets came through. So, first up, um, what are you singing at Fomioki tonight? What am I singing at Fomioki? Yeah. Uh, I haven't really decided. Maybe Pat Benatar all fired up. Mm -hmm. We were hoping something with love in it, but there you Rage go. Rage Against the Machine, Killing in the Name of. Because <laughs> <laughs> you do what you want to. <laughs> Now, Ben Shippey had a question, um, and he was particularly concerned about the risk of love. You know, we give a lot of ourselves, we, we run the risk of burnout, because yep. we love our patients and we are compassionate. Can you just tell us a little bit more about the risk to ourselves? You know, it's really interesting. The research is very, very clear on this. The harder you work at pushing things away, of containing things, 
of keeping him kind of, you know, isolated, locked off, like, I'm done with that, the greatest is your chances are of burnout. It takes an enormous amount of energy to keep things locked and, and, and siphoned off to the side. For most of us, and, and you know, that research is only looking at global populations. As you know with patients, there's always be people on the outside of that. But on the whole, having meaning, being very clear about why you do what you do, means that at the end of the day, it's a very strong protective factor. You know, Phil Sargent always says to me, don't be caught up you know, in the outcome, always be caught up in the process. So it means that if you are very clear that what you, what you really wanted to do was bring the best of your skills, the best of your ability, some you know, compassion and love for a family, then it doesn't actually matter what the outcome is for the patient, you know that you've done what, you, what the goal was. And it doesn't mean that it doesn't hurt at times, because it can, but it actually is a protective factor. Excellent. Well, on that note, we better thank Liz Crow again. Thank you.